not actually an atheist, I'm a lawyer. <laughs> I can argue both sides of any question. But it's a terrific time to be an atheist in Australia. After Cardinal George Pell declared on Q&A this week that atheists can go to heaven. <laughs> So why actually be, for example, a Catholic, all those midnight masses, Sunday sermons, choking on the communion bread, running the risk that your kids will be molested by the local priest, <laughs> when you can get to paradise without it? Of course, George says there's some kind of purging process, uh, some golden <laughs> celestial shower that you go through before <laughs> Or St. Peter hands you the keys to the Transcendental Hotel where hip replacements will be free on the afterlife disability scheme, where, where the television you can watch eternal repeats of parliamentary question time. <laughs> oh, I think that's purgatory. But, uh, you know, there's no, it's, it's wonderful. Atheists can go to paradise. I don't know about lawyers. God has to draw the line somewhere. <laughs> this is a lecture. It's an enormous privilege for me to give, uh, make a few remarks in memory of Christopher Hitchens, over whom death shall have no dominion. I guess if we took Hélène de Botton's rather silly idea that atheists should have cathedrals, Christopher would be up there in the stained glass, along with Voltaire and Mary Wollstonecraft, with Charles Bradlaugh and George Bernard Shaw. But he wouldn't have wanted this. He was the most humble of men. He saw himself as a jobbing journalist, using his enormous skill of literary and uh, investigative journalism to find the closest approximation there is to the truth. He was positioned as a kind of small boy pointing out that, that emperors have no clothes. Whether the emperors were Mother Teresa or the Queen, whether they were Dr. Kissinger or Bill Clinton, whether they were the Pope or God himself or herself. He was, in fact, someone who disdained all literary and uh, prizes. He said that the nicest thing had ever, ever said about him had been said by Kathy Lett. We had him for Christmas at uh, Palm Beach, north of Sydney, and uh, <laughs> Puberty Blues was one of the few books he hadn't read. So he challenged her to a race in the surf. <laughs> and he came out de disheveled and uh, dumped and defeated. And she said to him, never mind, Hitch. You still look like a spunk rat. <laughs> well, Christopher Hitchens was a man who I think, uh, oh, his books are on sale outside, of course. Uh, there were, uh, there's his biography, Catch to Autobiography, Hitch 22. Uh, for those of you wondering about the title, it was something devised in the first, <laughs> during the first coming of Monty Python, when we played those uh, word games, uh, what title was an almost ran, what title fell at the last edit, titles like uh, To Kill a Hummingbird, <laughs> or to The Catcher in the Wheat, <laughs> or For Whom the Bell Rings. <laughs> my, my favorite was Mr. Zhivago. <laughs> So we thought Hitch 22 was a suggestion for the final cut for Catch 22, and uh, he appropriated it for his autobiography, which is an honest and unassuming account of life spent puncturing, uh, puncturing the hypocrisy of others, including himself. Well, he had a passion for writing historical wrongs. One of his first very important books is Imperial Spoils, The Curious Case of the Elgin Marbles. It's out of print, 
but it would have a big sale here in Melbourne. Melbourne, for our overseas guests, is the Athens of the South. <laughs> at least in the sense that it's got more Greeks in it than Athens does <laughs> these days. I was hired uh, 18 months ago by the Greek government to lead a team of international lawyers to launch an action against the British Museum and museums in Germany and France to recover those looted Parthenon friezes. And uh, I found that Hitch's book is still the most compelling factual and historical statement of the case for their return. Unfortunately, the retainer was withdrawn when Greece collapsed into Euro debt. The government didn't think it was the right time to be suing the very co countries it was relying upon for its, for its bailout. <laughs> There is, through Hitch's journalism, a consistent passion for the justice, for the post-Nuremberg idea that political and military leaders who mass murder their own people should face retribution on earth rather than in hell or in history. Uh, hell, of course, uh, if it does exist, would be a serious breach of the Convention Against Torture. <laughs> And history, as Richard Nixon pointed out, depends on who writes it. Uh, so the idea of putting on trial those responsible for crimes against humanity appealed to Hitch. We'd become friendly at the New Statesman in the 70s. Uh, our daughters had been flower girls together at Salman Rushdie's wedding, uh, although I can't quite remember which one. And, uh, <laughs> He'd, uh, he'd heard that I'd been arguing the case for putting General Pinochet and Idi Amin on trial, and he rang me and said, take it a step further. Why not the trial of Henry Kissinger? Well, he went on to make a pretty good case for that uh, in his book of the same name and then in a documentary film. Some years ago, I suggested uh, that he might have uh, more luck with a charismatic evangelical who hardly anyone knew about, 2005, who was killing and enslaving children in northern Uganda. Uh, this was 2005, of course, when Joseph Kony was actually in Uganda. Uh, Hitch caught the next plane there and very bravely went into the jungle to meet Kony's victims and some of his killers, producing, uh, I think, his most blazing and brilliant piece of investigative journalism called Childhood's End, an African Nightmare. You'll find it in the collection called Arguably uh, in the bookshop. He starts uh, with remembering the running children that he saw. They are running for their lives from the Lord's Resistance Army, this grotesque zombie-like militia which has abducted, enslaved, and brainwashed more than 20,000 children. A kind of Christian Khmer Rouge has for the last 19 years set a standard of cruelty and ruthlessness that, even in a region with living memory of Idi Amin, has the power to strike the most vivid terror right into the heart and other viscera. Here's what happens to the children who can't run fast enough. Read this if you read nothing else in his work. It's a model of courageous, passionate, and factual journalism getting at a, tr at a truth that six years later that viral video on Coney never admits, namely the perverted biblical basis for his atrocities and the support that he's had from crazed evangelicals in the United States. The brainwashing and brutalizing of children was one of Hitch's abiding concerns, which is why he called me 18 months ago with a question about the news reports about child sex abuse in the Catholic Church. Could this amount to a crime against humanity? Might the Pope, arguably, be accountable under international law standards for a crime against humanity? It was at his prompting that I wrote the book, The Case of the Pope, that sought to answer these questions. And they're timely ones, of course, here in Melbourne, where Justice Cummins has urged a royal commission. According to Victorian police, some 40 victims in the last 10 years have committed suicide. In that period, 65 priests have been convicted, and a further 53 have been the subject of compensation payments. That 
that's 118 molesters, most of them with 20, 30, sometimes over 100 victims in the course of their life, and they're the only ones that have been outed. So thousands upon thousands of children in this state of Victoria uh, have been abused, and some of them have committed suicide. The case for a royal commission is compelling. The appalling facts of child sex abuse within the worldwide Catholic Church are now well established by judicial inquiries in Ireland, describing them as endemic within boys' schools, by studies in America which implicate up to 10% of the Catholic priesthood, by revelations in England about misbehaving monks and uh, in Europe which have exposed the guilt of bishops and even of cardinals. The practice of moving molesters to different parishes greener pastures with unsuspecting flocks is legendary. And it's clear that the Vatican has routinely and knowingly approved the transfer of pedophile priests to third world countries, especially to Africa, where the moderator of the African church says they sent us wolves in sheep's clothing. In the last 30 years, well over 100,000 children have been bewitched, buggered, and bewildered by their priests. When parents or victims complain, these wrongdoers are protected by canon law, the law of the church which requires any complaint to progress in utter secrecy without being reported to any outsider, least of all to the police. When a priest is found guilty under canon law, really the only punishment, there is no punishment other than what they call penance, which involves an order to say lots of Hail Marys or to say prayers for the victim. But victims don't want prayers, they want justice. And they don't get it from a church that hides their its priestly offences to protect its reputation and especially to protect its finances. And this is what... <clears throat> And that's why the Vatican, even now, refuses to impose mandatory reporting to the police. In some places, including Victoria, the church says, oh, of course, we, we'll report voluntarily, but only if the victims consent. And that, of course, is the catch-22 pointed out by Justice Cummins. It's very easy to discourage them by bullying them, their only kids, or by telling their parents that it would be an ordeal. Let it be dealt with within the family, leaving the guilty priests still in holy orders and still liable to offend again. I'm glad to say that as a result of some human rights standards, the law is changing. In Britain a few months ago, the Court of Appeal rejected an argument by the church that has worked in Australian courts terribly to deny victims' offence. What they say is, oh, under canon law, the priest is not the employee of the bishop, so the bishop can't be sued for damages. Well, the Court of Appeal in Britain in November ruled that bishops are vital vicariously liable for the sexual misbehavior of their priests and are legally bound to compensate for the pain and suffering they cause. <laughs> And this judgment was based, the court said, on, I quote, the immense power and trust with which priests are endowed in respect to children. And I think even more significant is the case in Philadelphia at the moment, the first case of a church official, a monsignor, being prosecuted for the crime of aiding and abetting three of his priests to rape boys that he placed under their care, knowing that these priests had pedophile propensities. This is the first case where the criminal law is being deployed against those who are most to blame. Those church officials, the higher, those in the church hierarchy who keep silent in order to protect the church's reputation and its money. The highest of all of these figures, of course, is Pope Benedict. Justice Cummins urges that the law be passed, a new law in Victoria be passed imposing mandatory reporting duties on bishops priests and church workers except for information divulged in the confessional. 
I don't agree with uh, an exemption for the confessional. Why should this religious ritual be endowed with some legal cloak of confidentiality? There can be no confidence in iniquity. There can be no justification for an exemption to allow priests to confess, confess their guilt in private and be absolved by their colleagues on pain of saying a few Hail Marys. I mean, forgiveness is the right, surely, of victims, not of fellow priests, of brothers. Brother, can you spare a crime? Sure, brother, so long as you pray that the kid doesn't commit suicide and that if he does, it doesn't get to the age. Well, I don't want to sound like Darren Hinch. I've defended pedophiles. I've had excrement put through my letterbox for doing so, and I know these men can do good as well as ill. But there's a deeper question here, and it concerns the legitimacy of allowing any religion to indoctrinate children at a very early age by priests whom they encourage to believe have supernatural powers. The Catholic Church has this problem in particular because it takes children at the age of seven to communion, an awesome experience in which the priest is God's agent, performing the miracle of changing the bread and wine into the body and blood of Christ. Then at the same age, the impressionable and anxious child is forced to confess to sin under fear of hellfire. He receives again salvation from God's priest. And this is why he develops such an emotional and psychological respect for the molester that he unflinchingly obeys his sexual demands. And for weak-willed, sexually confused, infantile celibates, the priests, so many of them, the temptation to abuse this power they find hard to resist. And this is the real reason why child abuse happens so often in the Catholic Church more than in other religions that don't confirm children until, like the Jews or the Anglicans, they're 13 or 14 until they're teenagers. Of course, the power of the priest can lead to abuse in all faith. There's a terrible rabbinical uh, sex abuse scandal in New York at the moment, and the Anglicans, too, have, uh, have failed in some respect. But if the Vatican wants to minimize child abuse, it must raise the age at which it commences formal indoctrination of children. This is the real challenge to the Vatican. Take your hands off children until they're old enough to think for themselves. The Vatican refuses to accept this challenge. At this moment, its newspaper is campaigning to lower the age of communion to five. That Jesuit boast, give us the age of the, give us the child at seven and he's, he'll be ours for life, should be recognized for what it is. Give us a mandate for brainwashing. Of course, young children can be exposed to religion, told about it from an early age. How many Sunday morning lions would parents enjoy were it not for Sunday school? But the law should ban any formal induction into the supernatural by way of confession, confirmation, or communion until at least the age of 13. But the Vatican accepts no responsibility for the abusers by its priests, its top officials blame. Here is a list of current excuses. Aggressive secularism, homosexual infiltration, the permissive culture of the 60s, Jewish journalists on the New York Times, <laughs> journalists in general, modernity, and of course, the devil. The Vatican is a power in the world because it is or claims to be a state and its bogus statehood is accepted by, without demur by otherwise sensible countries like Australia and by the UN where it opposes all measures designed to improve the status of women, to encourage family planning or to deal with the scourge of HIV AIDS by the supply of condoms. In unholy alliance with Muslim states, especially Iran, it condemns homosexuality as evil, 
opposes abortion under any circumstances, even to save a mother's life. And of course, it tried to stop UN agencies from supplying morning after pills to women raped by Serb soldiers. Uh, and this, you know, to allow it to do this with other real states is doubly outrageous because the Vatican is a Santa Claus state. No matter how many believe in its statehood, it simply doesn't exist. It claims uh, to be made a state by the Lateran Treaty in 1929, but that was a squalor deal between Mussolini and a pro-fascist pope in order to secure fascism in Italy. In law, a state has to have territory. The Vatican has none. It's merely a palace with a museum and gardens attached. In international law, a state must have a permanent population. The only residents of the Vatican are celibate clergy and nuns. No one gets born there except by accident. <laughs> There are no Vaticanians to enter the Olympics or play in the World Cup. Even the Papal Guards are Swiss. It would be comic if it were not for the damage that the Vatican does to human rights and the progress of women in the world. It's no more a state than Disneyland, which is larger and has more outlandish costumes. But of course, the Vatican is a political convenience. Here in Australia, it's long served as a dumping ground for inconvenient politicians, Vince Gare and Brian Burke, Australian ambassadors to the Vatican. We've just paid millions of dollars for, year, for security for Tim Fisher. The idea that anyone could notice Tim, let alone want to bump him off, uh, is absurd. But there's an opening for this position at the moment for Australian ambassadors to the Vatican in the spirit of the appointment of Brian Burke. Perhaps the ALP should appoint Craig Thompson. <laughs> the ideal. I'll be the candidate who can spend the next few years praying for forgiveness. We have a new, incredibly expensive embassy at the Vatican. Did you know that Australian tourists aren't allowed to enter it? Uh, I'm one of the very few who's actually been inside. I can tell you, it's at the top of a lovely old building just beneath the Castel St. Angelo. And it's got a glass ceiling. You look up at the ramparts, you expect Floria Tosca will come crashing down uh, at any moment. Uh, but it's no use to Australians because because if you have your passport pickpocketed while you're looking up at the Sistine Chapel, which is a very common occurrence, uh, and you go to the Australian Embassy to the Vatican, they won't allow you in. They say, go down, walk a few hundred yards down the road to the equal, even more expensive Australian Embassy to Italy, where Amanda Vanston was uh, ensconced until re recently. So that proverbial mug, the Australian taxpayer, pays for two embassies within 200 yards of each other. And what makes this even more ridiculous is that Ireland, that most Catholic of countries, has just closed its embassy to the Vatican. Just Firstly, the TSR, the Prime Minister says, to save money because it's pointless, but secondly, as a protest to, against the way the Vatican Papal Nuncio to Ireland so wickedly tried to cover up the scandal of church of child abuse in Ireland. The Irish were so furious about his behavior, his denials, his secrecy, uh, his uh, deceitful behavior, that uh, the Vatican had to withdraw him. Uh, they had to find a safe place to send him. You know where they sent him? They sent him to Australia, <laughs> where he's now the papal nuncio, safe in the bosom of Cardinal Pell. Well, let me move on. At this global convention of atheists, to bring you some good news about the developing human rights jurisprudence that is insisting that atheists be accorded the same rights and privileges as the religious. There must be no discrimination between believers in God and believers that there is no God. 
This is in an interpretation that flows from the wording of Article 18 of the International Convention on Civil and Political Rights, which guarantees the right to, I quote, religion or belief or belief. I emphasize an atheism is a positive belief. So the Human Rights Committee has ruled, I quote, Article 18 protect, protects theistic, non-theistic, and atheistic beliefs, as well as the right not to profess any religion or belief. So as a matter of international law, which upholds the rule that states must not discriminate between holders of different religions or beliefs, atheists and agnostics can say, claim the same privileges and protections as religious believers and laws must not specially privilege the religious. Now this is important to understand because uh, to refute the increasingly shrill claim by the churches that, oh, we're being subjected to aggressive secularism and militant atheism by court rulings, rulings that there must not be prayers before council meetings, or that Christians cannot wear their crucifixions at work, crucifixes at work, or that homosexual couples uh, should not be denied the right to adopt. There's nothing aggressive or militant about these rulings at all. They're simply cases brought by atheists who claim the same equality rights as Christians or are concerned to ensure that Christians are not specially privileged by reason of their religion. This was the basis of the great secularist decision by the European Court of Human Rights in Sahin and Turkey upholding a government ban on the wearing of headscarves at universities. Wearing a headscarf at an educational institution, it said, I quote, might have proselytizing effect seeing it was imposed on women by a religious precept that is hard to reconcile with the principle of gender equality. And it could not be reconciled with, I quote, the message of tolerance, respect for others, and above all, equality and non-discrimination that all teachers in a democratic society should convey to their pupils. Well, this decision is regarded... This decision is regarded as the high watermark of militant secularism. But it simply makes the point that in a democratic society, any sexist or superstitious practice can be denied privileged protection, whether it arises from religion or from politics or trade unions or Freemasonry, if it infringes the rights and freedom of others, especially the right to equal treatment. This cry we hear so often in Britain and Australia of militant atheism isn't, of course, only uttered by the Christians. It, <laughs> in Britain, the last few months, it's been uh, uttered most loudly by all the Hindus in Wales who were terribly upset when the Welsh Assembly, the Welsh government, ordered the slaughter of Shambo the sacred bull who belonged to a Hindu temple. Poor Shampo, Shambo had bovine TB, which posed a threat to all the meat in Wales. I made the suggestion that uh, Shambo the sacred bull might perhaps be put on a sacred barge and sailed into the Irish Sea beyond the jurisdiction of the Welsh Assembly. But uh, poor Shambo suffered the fate for putting at risk all the cows in Wales. Meanwhile, I, I they were really named Mr. and Mrs. Bull, who were an evangelical couple who ran a, ran a guest house, were ordered to com compensate two gay civil partners uh, in a stable relationship who they turned away from their stable door late at night. Uh, <laughs> I've always acknowledged the parable of the Good Samaritan as one of the bases for or inspirations for human rights. Uh, I just wish Christians sometimes would take it more seriously. Seriously. Well, there are many examples in many countries of special privilege for the religious, and it's time they came under attack from human rights lawyers, the angels' advocates. But here in Australia, they range from prayers in Parliament to the closure of bottle shops on Good Friday. But the law, of, the law of most consequence is that relating to tax. 
which exempts any organization from tax if it's a religious institution. The High Court has ruled that to be tax exempt you, 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 as a religion, you require only a belief, I quote, in a supernatural being, thing, or principle. And that was a ruling that Scientologists are tax exempt. So, of course, the Jehovah's Witnesses, Hillsong, the Free Deist Community of Australia, and for that matter, the Lord's Resistance Army, were Joseph Coney to set it up with other Christian sects in Toowoomba. Uh, this is massively unfair. Human Rights Watch has been trying for years to get government approval for a tax-exempt status, but it, it's incredibly difficult. Here, if you're a secular do-gooder, but automatic if you're a religion, no matter how crazy. If we had a Federal Rights Act, of course, with an anti-discrimination protection, uh, this state of affairs could be challenged, which is doubtless why George Pella, Pell campaigned, campaigned so ferociously against a Bill of Rights. I suppose if you can't lick them, join them. Atheist foundations could qualify for tax exemption by declaring their belief in Christopher Hitchens. <laughs> We could uh, turn him into an L. Rod Ron Hubbard figure to be worshipped through his sacred books. Uh, but this would be taking Elaine de Botton's suggestion too far. <laughs> A better answer would be for governments to pass laws requiring the main tax break churches, or religions, to um, use, to open their churches, built mainly on public money, to offer some public service in return. I've often thought, when driving through the countryside, uh, that it'd be really useful to require churches to offer public toilet facilities to passing motorists. When caught short, you'd always know where to go by looking to the nearest steeple. <laughs> Here's the church. <laughs> Here's the church. Here's the steeple. Open the door. Where's all the people? <laughs> where have all the people gone? to the Global Atheist Convention, everyone. <laughs> we could take Elaine so far as to produce nursery rhymes for atheists. But of course, the proper answer to this egregious discrimination is to abolish tax breaks for all religions. They They are businesses, after all. They should pay the going rate in corporation tax. Government need not go as far as Henry VIII and seize the wealth of the monasteries. Uh, although, come to think of it, <laughs> we could have a steeple tax refundable in heaven. But uh, <laughs> I can't envisage an Australian parliament taxing the churches any time soon since our parliamentary day begins not with one, but with two prayers. The Lord's Prayer and a special prayer wherein Almighty God is humbly, humbly beseeched to vouchsafe his blessing so that Parliament's deliberations will, and I quote, lead to the advancement of thy glory. So um, perhaps we should think of the carbon tax as God's answer to our prayers. It's... Uh, it uh, perhaps uh, it will restrain those noxious emissions rising to heaven from Queensland coal. But uh, here's an interesting thing. Section 116 of the Australian Constitution actually says, the Commonwealth shall not make any law for establishing any religion or for imposing any religious observance or for imposing any religious observance. So how on earth does Parliament get away with imposing prayers at the start of every day? It can't do so. Constitutionally, by law, the law would be unconstitutional if it did. So very sneakily, they provided for it by way of internal standing orders. The prayers in Parliament are only justified by these internal standing orders that have no legal basis. Can you subvert section 116 of the Constitution just like that? Someone should bring a case. We need angels advocates to take that case to the High Court. 
section 116 goes on to provide no religious test shall be required for any office or trust under the Commonwealth. Sounds terrific. No religious test for any office under the Commonwealth. Um, mm, what about our head of state? This is an office under the occupied by the British monarch, a personage defined by the 1701 Act of Settlement as a member of a family carrying the genes of the 17th century German Protestant princess, Sophia of Hanover. And the Act of Settlement requires that the monarch, the head of state of Australia, remember, should be a communicant member of the Church of England, and it sets the monarch up as the head of the Church of England, and it lays down that anyone who becomes or is married to a Catholic, or heaven forfend a Methodist, or Rastafarian or atheist, cannot sit on the throne. So supporters of uh, having William as the next king rather hope that his father will become an atheist or declare himself some form of vegetable worshipper so that, <laughs> so that he'll be disqualified. But uh, it was quite clear the monarchy itself with this inbuilt discrimination of the Church of England uh, is contrary to section 16. Uh, unless, of course, I suppose if you took it to court, the high court mates might say that uh, the, the, the royal family occupies an office over the Commonwealth rather than under it. But there it is. We have the absurdity of a, a British Anglican uh, being head of state of Australia, notwithstanding our atheist prime minister. Well, these absurdities would appeal to Hitch. One of his early works was The Monarchy, a Critique of Britain's Favourite Fetish. But uh, in a sense, this is really really comic relief when compared with the terrible cruelty that faces atheists in many parts of the world. Where atheophobia, and that's a real word, I've checked it with Stephen Fry, atheophobia. <laughs> Atheophobia is rampant. Atheists in Islamic countries are persecuted as apostates under the most despicable provision of Sharia law, which lays down death for men and life imprisonment for women who become apostates. In Saudi Arabia today, atheists are arrested. They're locked up for three days and given the opportunity to repent. Otherwise, they're taken out and executed. Uh, almost all of them do repent. Uh, e Egypt's persecution of atheists is unlikely to end under the Muslim Brotherhood. Allah Hamad served a year in prison for writing a novel deemed to contain atheistic ideas. In 2006, the Algerian parliament passed a new law decreeing between two and five years in prison for any atheist who criticizes Islam. In Jordan, atheists must associate themselves with a recognition recognized religion to obtain ID papers. In Indonesia, they have difficulty registering births and marriages. In Pakistan, atheists as well as Christians are threatened with prison, even with death for blasphemy. These laws are in blatant contra contravention of the Universal Declaration, which expressly guarantees the right to change one's religion. So let us, at this global convention of atheists, spare a moment to salute all those who today, throughout the world, are risking imprisonment and even death because they share our belief. There is no country in the world that has killed more atheists in recent years than Iran, run by mullahs without mercy, who will soon be capable of acquiring a nuclear weapon. This is a subject upon Hitch, which Hitch, had he lived, would undoubtedly have waxed, because it's the gravest problem the world will be facing over the next few years, the bomb in the hands of people whose religious beliefs may compel them to use, use it. Let me explain. In August 1988, 
The Ayatollah Khomeini was forced, so he told his people, to drink a bitter cup of poison, the truce in the Seven Year War with Iraq. In secret, to guard his theocracy, he issued a fatwa requiring all political prisoners who were atheists, who were Moharib, enemies of God, to be killed. There were many thousands of them, atheists, Marxists, Mujahideen, in Iranian prison. And uh, last year, I published a report after interviewing a number of survivors. This is what I found. For them, the death committees, headed by a religious judge, came to the prisons under the supervision of the army commander, Rafsanjani, and the president, Ali Khamenei, who is now Iran's supreme leader. They sentenced to death all men and many women who they deemed, after a two-minute hearing, to have no belief in Allah. They were blindfolded and ordered to join a conga line of prisoners that led straight to the gallows. They were hung from cranes, four at a time, or in groups of six, from ropes hanging in front of the stage of the prison assembly hall. Some were taken to army barracks at night, directed to make their wills, and then shot by firing squad. Their bodies were doused with disinfectant, packed in refrigerated trucks, and buried by night in mass graves. Months later, their families were given plastic bags with their few possessions, and ordered never to look for their graves or to mourn for them in public. In this period, at least 7,000 non-believers were massacred, some reports say as many as 30,000. Well, in that report, uh, I considered it to be probably the worst single crime in recent history involving mass murder of political prisoners. Worse, actually, than the Japanese death marches. Worse, in many ways, than the killing of those men, Muslim men and boys at Srebrenica. These in, were all long-term political prisoners whose only crime was atheism, their non-belief in the god imposed by the theocratic government of Iran. That government lied about it to the UN, still tries to cover it up by preventing the victims' families from mourning at the mass graves that, that have been discovered. Well, the perpetrators of this atrocity are mostly still alive and in high office in Iran's theocracy and judiciary. The Ayatollah Khomeini died the following year after his public fatwa, of course, on Salban Rushdie. But the other perpetrators of this crime are against humanity have been promoted and rewarded. Most uh, blatantly, of course, Ali Khamenei, the president in 1988, now the supreme leader. Uh, a man described by Hitch as a semi-literate megalomaniac. He is the supreme leader of Iran, far more important, actually, than Rafsanjani. They are the men that in 2009 broke the Green Revolution, killing many and torturing them once again, as in 1988 at Even Prison in Tehran. These are the men who, it's undisputed, sought nuclear weapons technology from the AK Khan network and elsewhere. These are the men who are now progressing towards a full nuclear fuel cycle, a position from which their scientists can readily switch to produce nuclear weapons. The Supreme Leader denies that they have that intention, but he's lied so consistently in the past that he can't be believed. The WikiLeaks cables have shown how Saudi Arabia, Jordan have been pleading with the US to strike Iran. Israel may do so before this year is out. Of course, Israel has the bomb, about 120 nuclear bombs, it said. Why shouldn't Iran build some too? Iran is a theocratic state that not only kills atheists, but is constituted under a particular Islamic belief that has no counterpart. It is the belief shared by the supreme leader and by most of the other mullahs, by the revolutionary guards, by the besieged militias, the thugs who killed Neda bin Sultan and so many others in 2009. It's a belief that turns upon the re-emergence of the 12th Imam, who is currently said to be in oculation, which is a uh, kind of uh, hidden existence. Uh, 
and uh, he will come back and destroy all the atheists, all the Maharabs, members of all other faiths, and will establish the Islamic millennium. Peace and justice for all except other faiths and atheism, atheists. What Iran's religious texts say is that this second coming will be triggered by a chaos, and their description of the chaos which will trigger it sounds pretty suspiciously like a nuclear war. So the fear is not only that with nuclear weapons Iran will try to wipe out Israel, but that it will relish the opportunity to create the kind of chaos that will trigger the second coming of the 12th Imam. This is a fear that leads some to urge an attack on Iran. I would rather see the UN set up a court to prepare an indictment for all those who perpetrated the mass murder of atheists in 1988. A, a regime that's allowed a regime that is allowed to grant itself impunity for the mass murder of unbelievers may well decide to mass murder them again. So, Hitch, where are you now to make sense of all of this? Looking downwards, perhaps, from Cardinal Pell's heaven, to see Iran, a nation which wants the 12th Imam to return in nuclear, in, in nuclear chaos, attacked by the Zionists in Israel, who have their own nuclear bombs, backed by a United States which has 15,000 nuclear weapons, led perhaps by President Mitt Romney, a Mormon, who therefore believes that when he dies, he'll go to his own planet. <laughs> he believes, as a Mormon, that the ancient Jews built boats and sailed to America that Jesus visited upstate New York in 1823 with golden plates that Joseph Smith buried in his garden so no one could find them uh, to disprove the Book of Mormon. It's a book that's very rude about black people. But Mitt Romley believes that in 1978, God contacted the head of the Mormon church in Salt Lake City and said that he'd changed his mind about Afro-Americans. <laughs> Well, it's a crazy world, ladies and gentlemen. It could get a lot crazier. It makes it a joy to celebrate the memory of a man who tried so hard to make it a saner place. Thank you. <laughs>